Welcome. Um, my name is Ross Cranston. I'm a professor of law in the, um, in the school. Um, first of all, I have to tell you some very basic things. Uh, if the fire alarm goes off tonight, it's genuine. <laughs> so run. Um, I also have to tell you that the proceedings are being um, recorded and uh, there's also going to be a photographer. There she is. Welcome the photographer. Um, so if you don't want to be recorded and if you don't want to be photographed, get on the ground. <laughs> um, or get behind the cameras or tell the photographer that um, you don't want to be photographed. Um, so uh, I also have to tell you, and in fact, we've just done it, turn your mobile phones off, please. So welcome to this uh, uh, debate. And I say debate because I'll explain in a moment how it's going to be conducted. Um, I have to tell you, in fact, I'm instructed to tell you, it's down here on the piece of paper, that this event forms part of the New World Disorders series held in a run-up to the LSE Festival, which is a week-long series of events taking place from the 25th of February to the 2nd of March 2019. It's free to attend and open to all, and explores how social science can tackle global issues. How do we get here? What are the challenges? And importantly, how can we address them? The full program is available online from January 2019. That's the advertisement. Right. I also have to tell you that for 20 users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Future of Money. Right. So let's get down to the serious business. We've got three uh, excellent members of the panel. Uh, on my immediate left is uh, Nicola uh, Shiparov, who's the CEO of uh, Moneyfold Limited. Next to him is um, John Danielson, who's co-director of the Systemic Risk Centre here at school. And then next to him is Eva Mikola, who's a, um, a colleague of mine in the law department, but also at the Systemic Risk Centre um, at the LSE. Each of them is going to speak for about five or ten minutes. Then they're going to have a debate amongst themselves, and you'll see why, because they take contrary views. And then we're going to open it up to the floor. If there are no questions, they're then going to debate further. I'll then ask for more questions. If there are no questions, they'll keep on debating. They tell me they can go for three hours if necessary. <laughs> So that's how we're going to organise events, and thanks very much for coming, and um, it's going to be a, uh, a splendid evening. So, Nicola. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? People in the back at the top? Okay, so it seems like everybody can hear me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I, it's my first appearance at the London School of Economics, and you know, hopefully uh, it's a good one and I get invited back, and, and if not, so be it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, such as uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, etc. And I'm especially a big fan of the underlying blockchain technology and what it allows us to, to do. Uh, so I want to share with you briefly about my journey and, and why I got involved and, and why, why I keep getting involved. Uh, I spent about uh, 10 years working in global markets IT for banks in, in North America, in, in, in Europe, in the UK, in, in Africa. And uh, when, 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 you're, when you're a big bank, obviously you have to process payments, you have to process uh, various uh, security instruments, and all of that gets recorded digitally in, in various systems. You have execution systems, order management systems, reporting compliance regulatory systems, etc. And uh, after 10 years, I, I quickly realized, well, not quickly, it took me 10 years, but after 10 years, <laughs> I, I finally uh, uh, came to the conclusion that uh, there are a lot of uh, limitations and there are a lot of uh, technological and operational risks and that every control we put in place, uh, people find ways to get around it. 
And uh, accidentally, I discovered this thing called Bitcoin, and I started studying it in, in, in detail, and I realized that whatever is recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, cannot be changed, or, or rather, the way to change it is uh, what's called the 51% attack, mm -hmm. and, and it's very, very, very expensive. Uh, now, in, in terms of... Uh, uh, definitions, uh, cryptocurrencies are, are cryptographic tokens which are native to a public blockchain system. So this, this or, or public DLT is, is uh, another term used for it, DLT being di distributed ledger technologies. And uh, we, without the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin blockchain cannot operate. Similarly, without the Litecoin, the Litecoin blockchain, the Litecoin network cannot operate. Uh, so that's it's a requirement to have that uh, unit of account or coin of exchange or, or cryptocurrency or, or whatever term you want to use it to describe it. Uh, and so the first realization is, well, if you want to record data and make sure it's immutable or make sure it's very, very, very difficult to change, uh, a, a blockchain-based uh, system is very useful for that. And the second realization was that this Bitcoin or, or, or unit of exchange is actually quite useful in its own right to make transactions. It's digital in nature. Anybody in the world can send it or receive it. So you have an open, permissionless uh, you know, financial system, uh, which you know, for, for me personally, it's, it's a very valuable thing. So to give you an example, in 2014 or 15, I tried to purchase uh, uh, machinery equipment from Sweden, and I tried to, pan to pay with my uh, UK bank account, and, and I wasn't able to. And, and the reason was that there was a limit. I could only spend 10,000 pounds from that bank account in a given day, and I spent about half an hour on the phone with the bank, pressing through their options, speaking to representatives to convince them that this is my money and I want to spend it on this, on this transaction and purchase this machinery. At the end, I gave up. So instead, I paid with Bitcoin, which took me about one minute to execute. Uh, and then it took about 40 minutes for the transaction to actually process and be recorded on the blockchain. But the point is, it's, a, it's an example of where I tried to make a payment and I couldn't. Uh, to give you another example, just last month I was in Valencia on holiday. I paid for my British Airways flight using Bitcoin. I paid for uh, some of the tapas we had in Valencia uh, using Bitcoin. So uh, even though I think uh, in, in the general population maybe less than 0.2% of people have cryptocurrencies, the reality is anywhere that Visa card is ac accepted, you, you, you can use, use them to pay. It's... it's I should put in some caveats, as in you use the Bitcoin to load a prepaid Visa debit card, but that takes seconds to execute on, on an app on your phone. And once you've done that, you can pay anywhere Visa card is expected, uh, accepted. And uh, so this does raise the, the question of, uh, well, are these cryptocurrencies a store of value? Are they money? Are they a transactional system? Are they all of the above? And how mainstream can they become? Are there uh, perhaps uh, layer two technologies or, or, or better coins that can enable anybody in the world to, to transact seamlessly without having to ask for permission from, from a third party. So that's my uh, opening comments, and uh, I'd like to hand over to John. So John, yeah. Look, okay, thank you, Nicola. Just to, to ask you who's an academic, I should probably give a little bit of introduction to the topic, but, and I'm gonna start two and a half millennia ago, because before that time, the way we used to do transactions was by IOUs. Then some clever chap, or in three countries, because it was in China, India, and Lydia simultaneously, two and a half thousand years ago, discovered coins as a mean of transactions, and we never looked back since. And of course, along the way, money has taken a multiple forms like seashells, cigarettes, and silver. But the most staple arrangement we ever had was a gold standard. This gave us an unprecedented stability for 50 years until World War I sort of upended the apple cart, if you will. But the gold standard was a stable but not a happy arrangement because uh, mining didn't keep up with economic growth, prices continued to fall, while not damaging economically, it did little for social stability because deflation meant workers' salaries were continually falling, debtors were continually suffering, and ex commodity exporters were in frequent crisis. But creditors did well, the city of London did handsomely. The gold standard was marked by social strife and economic crisis, while, of course, delivering stability along the way. Then we got fiat, 
comes from a Latin, let it be done. It's an old arrangement that goes back to China to the 12th century and is very frequently abused. Central bank controls the money printing and can print too much. I'm old enough to remember the 1970s, a horrible decade when it came to economic policy, and I didn't like the fashion very much either, to tell the truth. <laughs> the 1970s gave us the phrase stagflation, a combination of inflation and stagnation. Now, at that time, there was a lot of discussion about alternative, form of, alternative forms of money. For example, a former LSE professor, Friedrich Hayek, he, he was a strong advocate of alternative forms of money as competing with fiat at the time really badly managed. But since then, the central bankers have learned quite a lot. And now we have a 30 years of pretty good management of fiat money. Well, not everybody. We're still in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. And now we have a new kid on the block, cryptocurrencies that promises all sorts of wonderful things. It is really at the core of really elegant technology, and people who like technology, they like cryptocurrencies. Then, beyond that, they're supposed to give us freedom from governments, they're supposed to give us money that the governments cannot manipulate, and of course, that means no more quantitative easing. And last but not least, along the way, there's a lot of money to be made. Except, do cryptocurrencies really make any sense? Well, technical elegance is not enough to establish that they make sense. To take humans, I mean, I can study all the physics, all the chemistry, all the physiology of a human being, know how, the mole how mo molecules, how organs operate, and not know the first thing about how a human being operates. That is, the micro is different than the macro. It's the same with cryptocurrencies. Knowing the mechanical details does not translate into understanding their economic function. And along the way, a lot of questions have been asked. The media tends to focus on criminality. 1% of cryptocurrencies are stolen every year in hacks. And uh, the mining uses up 1% of the world's electricity supply, which is also most of it is made by fossil fuels. The cheapest way to do something about the environment is to ban cryptocurrency mining. But I want to talk about stability monetary stability, social stability, and, fin and, 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 and financial stability. And I do have to make a quick detour into monetary theory. Money created by central banks is called base money, and that is sort of akin to coins and cryptocurrencies. Neither base money nor most coins on the blockchain will be coins in daily use, because the reason is the financial system creates its own form of money, called M1, M2, and M3, and the like, along with derivatives. Now, this is inevitable for a simple reason. We will lend money to each other, and we will trade claims on those loans. The fiat system does, the gold system did, and so will a crypto system. And that means the quantity of money in circulation is never under anybody's control, not under gold, not under fiat, and not under cryptos. When the next crisis comes along, and yes, I promise you, there will be one, people will do exactly the same as they always do. They clamor for the most stable types of money under gold. It's, gold, it's, it's a physical gold coins. Under, under fiat, it is central bank-based money. And under crypto, it is coins on the blockchain. But in the fiat system, we have a safety valve. The central bank can adjust the supply of money to meet economic objectives. Uh, they can meet price stability and financial stability, something not possible under cryptocurrencies. If cryptocurrency becomes successful, the world will become more unstable financially and monetary than it is now. Now, still hypothetical. Does anybody really want to use cryptocurrencies? Not today, when they're only used for speculation and illegal transactions for most parts. The examples of sending more than 10,000 to Sweden, notwithstanding the loading of prepaid debit cards. But this is, these are really niche issues. And by the way, I looked at the transaction costs on an online bank, Revolut. I can do a bit fiat to fiat transaction costlessly. They will take 1% just to do the crypto transaction on top of what they pay the platform. And by the way, because of fragmentation of coins on the blockchain, that's not a trivial thing because you're not. 
because, because there are multiple transactions that may have to be assembled to go into one transaction, which is not a trivial or cheap thing to solve. So, for the foreseeable future, I, but if you look at, the, look at how we look, use money, I don't think anybody wants to earn their salaries in dollars, pay the mortgage in Bitcoin, and pay the hairdresser in, in Ethereum. Well, that may change, of course. And crypt, but I suspect if that happens, cryptocurrencies will either fully displace fiat money or become absolutely worthless. And suppose they are successful. I don't think they will. But suppose they are successful, then somebody certainly is going to make a lot of money. I did the math the other day, and if you look at the amount of base fiat money in the world, it is $50 trillion. The market value of cryptocurrencies, depending on the day to day, is about $150 billion. So therefore, if cryptocurrencies become successful, a handful of crypto speculators will get a 10,000 pound profit. Now, it will be the biggest expropriation of, of public wealth in human history, much bigger than the closure acts in this country or the Russian or Chinese privatizations more recently. So the success of cryptocurrencies would mean more monetary instability, more financial instability, more inequality, and more social instability. This means to me cryptocurrencies make absolutely no sense. And I think, I mean, I, I read quite a lot, and to me they feel like a religion or a cult, not a rational economic phenomena. They even had their own foundation myth, the elusive Satoshi Nakamoto. But I await my enlightenment. Well, thanks very much. I shouldn't have put you two together. Um, <laughs> but we're now going to have a lawyer, and as ever, lawyers are dispassionate and neutral and objective. <laughs> yes, uh. yes, and I'm happy to deliver. So let me start by uh, maybe introducing some distinctions. Um, and one distinction I'd like to draw is that there's a difference between the messenger and the messenger and the message. So when we speak about cryptocurrencies, I think it's worth separating the technology from the content that the technology records and transfers. I think that's a very important distinction. And once you do that, um, you realize that cryptocurrencies or crypto assets are no way of preventing fraud. Because fraud doesn't occur in the, in the sort of in the technology. Fraud occurs by people issuing something through technology that has no value or that is a Ponzi scheme or that is something that is allegedly connected to an asset but in fact isn't. So this goes back to, um, you know, really the South Sea bubble when people sold shares in a company that was allegedly trading somewhere where in fact there were no such asset or the Brazilian, there's a very famous case, the Brazilian rubber plantation company where shares were sold in London, turned out they didn't have a plantation in Brazil. Um, so I think there is a sort of, and that argument needs to be made both ways. It needs to be made to say um, the messaging system is, can be useful, but that doesn't mean that the message the system delivers is good. So that would be a, a point to Victor, who sort of made the argument um, he moved from mainstream banking into um, the Bitcoin world because the, the sort of the recording system was so good. I think that's a good reason to like the technology, but that doesn't, shouldn't lead us into thinking that all the assets or, you know, the, the sort of the message itself is, is in any way better than it has been. Um, then the, so, so that's I think an important point to make. And then, um, and then, of course, the, the other distinction that's, that's useful to make is one that separates tokens from um, cryptocurrencies in a narrow sense where there is no asset that, that is lodged on a, a distributed ledger. The asset is a coin, and that coin is a string of an alphanumeric code a string of uh, numbers and letters, the transfer of which is recorded. Um, before I come to those, let me um, say a little bit about the tokenization and its usefulness. I think there's no doubt that there is a lot of inefficiency 
in the way assets are currently held and transferred. And I, I know this particularly for securities, so for shares and debt instruments where settlement cost is high, where we have recently had in the UK two cases where investors have held securities and were unable to enforce them. So this was a, a German investor who held shares in a UK registered company. He wanted to exercise some rights in a delisting. He couldn't do it. And that was because his name wasn't on the shareholder register. He held through a chain of intermediaries that blocked his claim, which I think is, is, an, is almost a scandal because we're, we're talking about operational connections that are made between two very developed jurisdictions that are close to each other geographically and where it is wrong to think that language would be a barrier. And that... And nevertheless, the system was unable to connect the two. So there's another case involving some debt instruments. So I think operationally, the technology can usefully make a contribution, which then leads me to a second problem, which is not an operational problem, but that's a problem. Is there a business case for it? Like, who is it that would benefit, or, would, or rather, let me flip this, who is it that would be able... Um, so I think that so the benefits are, are benefits that would be benefits for end investors. And the, there are some benefits for efficiencies between intermediaries, but I don't think there are enough of them to justify a sort of wholesale flip towards a sort of general harmonized system. So there's a sort of question of who is it, um, who, who, who has a business interest in uh, setting up the, the arrangement that would sort of standardize this. So, so that's one point to make. Then talking about um, cryptocurrencies in a very narrow sense, I think from a legal perspective, I would be, from a, certainly from a private law perspective, I would fairly radically say, we have managed a changeover from coins to paper. We have managed to recognize paper money in the form of negotiable instruments. We have moved from paper money to fiat money, where the money as a carrier is no longer exchangeable into anything. Um, it, there is no doubt that the law can and should be able to recognize something called a digital asset. So that is, I know there's, there's a sort of a transition that has to happen, but I think from a perspective of can this be something that property law can accommodate? Can you have ownership rights in a digital asset? There is, there is a sort of legal uncertainty, but I don't think there should be. I think it, it, it is, we should be able to say there is a category of property law called a digital asset. And I've said this in 2004 in relation to securities. I think, I think that is a, a leap that we can make, a leap that is probably easier for a common law than for a civil law system. So I give you that, you know, perhaps some systems will need legislation. Um, but I would, and, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss this further, but I would, be, I would be inclined to say the hurdle that this is just digitally recorded isn't something that property law should not overcome. And I think it will. Right, well, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to make the first invitation for questions and comments. If you're going, can you wait for the microphone and then can you declare um, who you are and where you come from? We always like to know if Kings or UCL people are sneaking into our lectures. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's someone up here at the back. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy Haynes, University of Wolverhampton. Nicola, um, just a, a question. You, you gave a, an entertaining tale of how useful Bitcoin had been. But if you'd had your money in sterling or Swiss francs, you could have done all the same things and had a lot more money left at the end because neither of them suffered the huge devaluation of Bitcoin. And whilst you were able to access it more usefully at the receiver end when you spent more than £10,000, you must realise you could have, had you known you were going to do that, you could have set up that facility in the UK before you went. So I'm not entirely convinced that in itself that's a powerful argument for any of us opening Bitcoin accounts. And I just wanted your views on that, please. 
So something about transactional costs. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are excellent points. So, I mean, my, my personal view is that, uh, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, and there's a number of other ones, are, uh, I see them as, uh, I think the economist said it best. Like, uh, I think they call it the truth engine, where, where, where we have a, a black box, we have a machine that, that tells the truth, that cannot lie. And it does that by, by having distributed consensus. So I think that in and of itself is a huge innovation. Uh, now, whether that innovation or a portion of it is, is, is good as a coin of exchange or a currency or a store of value, uh, the answer is I don't know. We, we have used it. I have used it to buy a cup of tea in London. Uh, so, so it can be used in this way, uh, and it's the first time we, we, we have a security mechanism that can be used in this way, right? Because, I mean, in the physical world, we have uh, the, the, the Army, the, the Ministry of Defense, uh, who have a lot of uh, equipment. We, we don't use fractions of that equipment to trade with each other every day. Instead, we use that as a, as a national security system, and we build second and third layer systems on top of that. So, so I, I completely agree with you that uh, the cost of transacting a Bitcoin and the volatility in the price of Bitcoin could be, um, you know, not helpful at all. Or, or, or uh, uh, but uh, if 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 you want to build a system on top of it which uses the security of the Bitcoin, uh, then it, it changes the story quite a bit. Uh, and so, so, so to give you my background, uh, in, 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 at the moment I started a company called Moneyfold. It's a two-year-old project. We went through the FCA regulatory sandbox and we opened cryptographic coins representing uh, pound sterling, euro, Swiss franc, you name it, national currency. So our idea was that, or our hypothesis was that most people uh, have money and, and want money and don't really care if it's secured by uh, a banking system or by a blockchain system or another system. Uh, now, to transact this, uh, these cryptographic pound sterling, you still have to pay a fee. Uh, in our case, we use the Ethereum blockchain, so you have to pay Ether to the miners who are securing those transactions. So if we move to a world where uh, the Bitcoin blockchain or, or the Ethereum blockchain or another public blockchain is being used purely as a security level, then it, it changes the conversation because you're no longer using Ether to, to buy machinery directly. You're using Ether to buy the security, uh, the, the digital network security of the payment system. And, and, and I think that's the direction we're, we're headed into for a number of reasons. John, do you want to comment on buying tapas in Spain or tea in London with Bitcoin? No, I have... I never used Bitcoin in my life, and I don't intend to, so I can't really draw from it from a personal experience. But I'm interested in this distributed consensus, right, because in the world there are about three miners who control more than, more than half the world's mining in, 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 in Bitcoin, and they're all owned by the same single Chinese entity. So essentially a single Chinese company owns not only all, produces all of the mining equipment, also owns two of the miners and big part of the third, and therefore, this isn't very distributed, right? It, ten, ten years ago, it used to be a bunch of small people who were mining stuff all in, 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 the, in the bedrooms, right? And then you could copy the blockchain and everything was, everything was properly distributed. Now, it has moved into an extreme form of concentration, so, 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 so the distributed angle is, is gone. But on... On this transactional bit, right, then, of course, when you use Ether, you, you are contributing to the 1% uses of, of world's electricity every year, which is not a good thing to be doing uh, in today's environment. However, here's a question I have for you on, on, on this. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a forum with senior bankers, and we were talking about technology. So, so my topic there was not cryptocurrencies, but artificial intelligence. But, but I'm going to ask you a question we discussed in the coffee break. Is blockchain or digital assets on the blockchain where you move away from the Bitcoin trust model onto something else, is it a topic for the IT geeks in the basement, or is it something a senior executives who are not IT-based should be talking about? In other words, is it just yet another IT technology as interesting to the IT community, but not outside of that. Well, is there something, some, some reason why people outside should be interested? Okay, so I think you raised about three different points. So shall I start with the 
Centralization versus decentralization? Yeah. Quickly? Quickly so that other people can have a go. Yeah, so, so I think you're oversimplifying a little bit. So I, I, I have a mining facility, and within that mining facility, I have three clients. So each one of them can, at any point in time, switch the mining pool or the, or the coin they're mining. And uh, I mean, in terms of, so, so it's not as centralized as you would think. The, the, there is, uh, my estimation is that on the planet, only the, the Communist Party of China has the power, the power to shut down or disrupt Bitcoin. I, I don't think anyone else has, has that power. Uh, and, and yes, there is a tendency towards centralization and industrialization, but I, I don't think it's down to three decision makers making those decisions. I think it's a much more uh, diverse group of people. Um, if, if, if one of the centralization points starts acting in, in, in a way that's not supported by the community, people simply point their miners to another mining pool or start solar mining or mine another coin. So that there's various you know, be behavioral hedges, uh, which, which may or may not work. Uh, now, on the point of uh, energy consumption, so the statistics I've seen was that uh, the, the specifically the Bitcoin network was consuming as much energy as the Republic of Ireland. I've also seen comparisons to uh, gold production. I've also seen comparisons to Denmark. And uh, it, it consumes about as much electricity, apparently, as the city of London. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, with uh, gold... Uh, digging gold out of the ground, bringing it to the surface, so mining, uh, then processing it, refining it, then distributing it, then, then storing it uh, in underground vaults. The amount of energy used in that process, from the statistics I've seen, it's about 13 times more than the energy being used on Bitcoin mining. Again, I don't have sources here, so you know, please, please take these at face value. Um, Iceland, curiously, is, is a big uh, mining location because of all the excess geothermal electricity that they can't do anything with. So some of the biggest Bitcoin mining farms are actually located underground in Iceland. I absolutely agree with the point that it's silly to burn fossil fuels in order to, to, to mine. Uh, but the reality is, in China, for example, many of the mi large mining operations in the south are using hydroelectric. Uh, which is a renewable source. Uh, same in uh, Sweden and Norway. In Sweden, there was a huge 100-megawatt uh, hydroelectric dam which sat idle for 20 years, and the only reason it was reopened and it created a number of local jobs was because Bitcoin miners decided to move into that uh, location. Um, Come back on some of the other points. Sure, yeah. Uh, there's one more. There's, I've got one. Any more questions before I take this? So we've got another one here. Anyone from upstairs? Not yet. So we've got two. I know he's not UCL or KCL. He's local. Um, and he's um, going to introduce himself. Edmund Schuster from the LSE. Um, I have a. I'm a. I would guess um, a lot of people are not particularly comforted by the fact that you say it's only the Communist Party of China that can shut this <laughs> up. But um, leaving this aside, I, um, imagine everyone in this room is on a plane and we are somehow stranded on, a, on, on an island because of a crash. And I write a beautiful paper explaining why seashells is mo using she seashells as money is a genius idea for our new economy. And you all buy in and then you realize that I have um, about a trillion of those seashells already stored in my cave. You'd probably say, Edmund, you know, I like your idea, but there are other shells out there. So um, let's use one of the others. And so given that Bitcoin is not protected or protectable at all, you can restart, even if you like the, the te technology, you can restart the same thing just with a new coin. Um, you just call it something else. You don't even have to fork it off. You just start a new Genesis block. So I, I'm, I'm a bit confused by the kind of long-term vision of Bitcoin moving to the 50 trillion. Um, wouldn't that be a remarkable trick to play on humanity, to say, yeah, I mean, I know your, your cave is full of those coins, but let's just still use it, even though it's about five lines of co code to restart this whole thing? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh, you're right on one thing. It is five lines of code. Um, it, 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 can any of us start our own central bank? Yes, we can. So we have, I don't know, 100 people in the room. We can have 100 central banks. Now, 
there are a number of people out there, close to somewhere between 10 and 20 million, who believe in Bitcoin specifically and who hold Bitcoin and would accept Bitcoin as, as a payment. There are 100,000 online merchants who will accept Bitcoin as payment. I mean, you can, you can buy all manner of stuff. You know, you can buy honey, you can buy uh, server space, you can, you can buy services. There are hundreds of companies out there paying their employees in, in various cryptocurrencies, in various tokens that are not themselves cryptocurrencies, but operate on top of cryptocurrency. So how do you convince someone that, hey, my, my money is better than your money? Or, or how do you convince the whole world, hey, use, you know, use the pound sterling, don't use the US dollar, right? Or, or use the, the Japanese yen, don't use the, this other uh, currency. I mean, that, that's, it's a very difficult thing to convince people to use your currency and that your currency is better than others. I specifically like uh, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum because the monetary policy has been fixed in time and, and it cannot be changed unless 51% of people agree to change it. And that's a quite difficult to, to convince because these are people in, in Russia, in Ghana, in Japan, in Ukraine, in, in all over the world, in this country, and trying to identify 51% of them and trying to convince them, uh, let's attack the system, that's very, very difficult. On the other hand, if, if you decide, well, let's compromise the central bank, you have a single point of failure. And I'm not, I'm not saying this one bank or another bank is, is, is compromised, but it's a very different risk model. It's a very different, uh, you know, trust setup. And, and you're absolutely right. You can, you can take a copy of, your, of uh, the Bitcoin code and start your own chain, and people have done that. And so far, no, nobody has succeeded. I mean, I'd love to see somebody succeed and come up with something better. John, you're on the same side as Edmund, but you want, to, I, you want I, to say something, I know. I'm a bit concerned by something you just said about the central banks have a single point of failure, while Bitcoin has the Communist Party of China as a point of failure. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know Edmund said it, but that is, not a, that, is not a tri that is not a trivial point either, right? Because we have been in a... We, if I have to use money in the United Kingdom that, that, the, that the Communist Party of China can choose to attack with a 51% attack or whatever it is, I will not want to use that money. And there's one observation about incumbency. In the UK, I think in most other countries, we are more likely to change our spouse than a bank account. I mean, we like our banks, right? And the, and the key thing there, though, is I think that is, is relevant to this, money is legal tender. And that means companies have to hold accounts in pound sterling in this country, and I have to pay my taxes in pound sterling in this country. And given the high tax rates in the United Kingdom, if LSE paid me in Bitcoin, and I had to pay a random tax payment in bit, if LSE paid me in Bitcoin, I had to pay a random tax payment in pound sterling compared to my salary, I'd be really distinctively unhappy. How are you going to how are you going to solve the power of incumbency? Think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel you, like like I have to solve all the world's problems, and this is a lot, a lot of pressure. I, I'm sure you've got some allies out there. Yes, well, I, just uh, I, can, I can comment, comment on comment incumbency. On? I think incumbency. There is there is obviously there have been times when the existing system of money that was state run didn't work, and you saw this you know, in the sort of during the inflationary years in, in Germany and Austria, where then local currencies emerged and people traded the paper that was issued locally outside of the banking system, and that worked. So I can, I can of course, see a world where custom flips because the current provision by the state isn't good enough. And you see this in the, develop, in the developing world where there's a sort of the dollar is, is a currency that is used and in, in a sort of in parallel to and, and, and in preference to very instable local currencies. So I think part of what we're discussing here depends on how well is the currency run by the central bank. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's an important. So down here, but then I want some allies with Nicola next, next time round. <laughs> Kevin James from the LLC. Um, so I was uh, persuaded by John's case that uh, cryptocurrencies don't make any sense. But I was thinking about uh, how that same argument would kind of apply to gold. 
uh, you know, canes famously called gold a barbarous relic back in the 1930s, but it's still here, and central banks are still using it. Um, but I think almost every aspect of your argument would also be used against why central banks would actually, or why people would bother holding gold as a financial asset. Uh, so for all the same reasons you discussed. So instead of having, thinking of it as crypto as either replacing fiat currency or, or fiat currency driving crypto to zero, don't you see maybe some possibility where crypto could become a sort of form of gold and sort of linger on as a small but still nonetheless present asset class? I mean, let's look at the market for gold right, and why, why people hold gold. The biggest market for gold in the world, world is India. And why India? Because in India, the vast majority of unbanked people who do not have access to financial services and their giving or holding gold is the only way you can save and invest. Right? But if you look at the price of gold in the very long run, it's a horrible store of value. It's done a horrible thing for investors over the past 50 years. So there's absolutely no reason for anybody to hold gold. And it's only there really for long-run historical reasons because somebody, somebody needed something like gold hundreds of years ago. So the, but the alternative is, and, 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 and the point Eva made is very important, if you have a system of badly managed fiat currencies, then other types of money become more attractive. And we have certainly seen wholesale rapid switches to monetary systems almost overnight, like, for example, in, in, in November 1924, when, when the, Germany went to one mark to another, and quite, quite easily and quite efficiently. But if you are sitting in a place like Venezuela with a horribly managed currency, you have a choice between Bitcoin or U.S. dollars. What are you going to pick? I would bet that almost every single person in Venezuela who wants, to look, wants, wants alternatives to the Venezuelan Bolivar, they would pick the U.S. dollar. So I, there are certainly edge cases where you, find, where you find alternatives, and you can certainly say that you can end up managing uh, fiat money really badly. But in the absence of that, there is no good economic case. Can I just mention something about Venezuela? Because uh, Venezuela was actually a very popular, uh, you know, for Bitcoin mining early on. Nowadays, they can't afford it. Uh, so instead, they, for, 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 for a couple of years, they were using something called rare Pepe cards as a coin of exchange, which is a, a, a Pepe card is like, a, think of it as a basketball card with, with a, like a Pepe character, which is like a green frog-like <laughs> creature and uh, striking different poses. And those were cryptographically secured on the Bitcoin blockchain using something called Colored Coins Protocol. And those were being used for, for, to, to, to make payment in, in Venezuela. Because if, if the government catches you with U.S. dollars in your pocket, guess what's going to happen? You know. So, so I mean, I, 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 well, anyways, that, that's about Venezuela and, and edge cases. Yeah. Okay. So down here, anyone upstairs? Yeah, there's someone here. So, okay, we'll take downstairs and then upstairs. Or I Thank you. Know. Tim Frost uh, at, uh, from the LSE. Um, the state seems to be lurking in the background of many of the things that you've said. So I wonder, could we address it directly? If you're advising issues of fiat currencies or states, what would you um, advise them to do with respect to cryptocurrencies? Thank you. So... Cryptocurrency, well, and I, I think John kind of made this point as well. I mean, it's, it's a hedge for macroprudential risk. So if you want to protect yourself from the state, one way of doing it is physical gold. Another way of doing it is Bitcoin or something similar. Uh, now, a state administration could use uh, blockchain technology and smart contracts to try and automate certain functions, to try and introduce transparency into processes like, like voting, like tendering, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the reality is they're probably 20 to 30 years away from that. I mean, they're, they're, they're struggling with much more fundamental, you know, questions like, like legitimacy and, and, you know, literacy and this kind of stuff. So. Eva, do you have yes, a comment? So, I, so first recommendation would be fund the serious fraud office to clamp down on fraud. Like, just get, get them on top of the Ponzi schemes. That would be my, my first recommendation. Um, I think. I just want to add to something that, that Eva just said. So, so uh, over the last three, so I always do my disclaimers, yeah? Uh, over the last three years, I've looked at about 200 uh, ICOs, initial coin offerings, and I, inv I participated in about 14 of them. And so there's a total of 2,000 out there that have been performed over the last three years. 
So if, I'm only looking, I found my opinion is based on 10% of the universe. And, and within those 200 projects, I would say about 30% are either uh, joke projects or, or outright frauds, outright Ponzi schemes where, where they're trying to scam people. Uh, there's another 70% that, that, you know, they had good intentions, but it's economically pointless. Like there is no product or the, the token doesn't represent anything. It's just a company that wants free working capital that it doesn't have to repay or, or you know, it's a case of they don't understand the technology. And there's only the top 10% where the use of the technology actually makes sense or whether, where they're trying to do something truly innovative. So I, mean, I, I, I agree. I'd love to see some enforcement in the UK and the EU. At the moment, it's enforcement's only coming out of the SEC. They've issued all, over 50 uh, actions. Uh, but yeah, so if, if funding the serious fraud office is a way of getting enforcement in the UK, then I completely support that. Yeah. Hi, I'm James, a uh, student of LSE and also a millennia. So I'm here for I'm I'm here on Nicholas' side, and this question is more for John. And I, John, I really love your Twitter page, but and I, I read a lot of your reports. But I feel like our underlying assumption behind the trust of the fiat currency is that the system under well-managed condition is better than the blockchain system or a cryptocurrency-based system. And you also mentioned that as we have we have exited the global financial crisis with more debt. Asset classes rising, all aspects higher, and we're also seeing financial crisis to be more severe year after year. So, how do you how do you how are you so sure that the assumption that we'll be able to well manage our fiat system? I'm going to challenge your last statement. So, I'm a student of history, and I do not think financial crises are becoming more severe. Uh, this is just not backed up by facts. I mean the there were no financial crises in the world between 1945 and 1973. There have been, been a few since then, but before that they were much more frequent, and the biggest financial crisis the United Kingdom ever saw was in 1963. So, uh, 1864. So I, I, do, I, do, I, do, I do challenge that, uh, that, that statement. However, the, the, the question you said, sort of, as I keep on, as I as I keep on saying, right, if you are comparing a well-managed fiat currency, it is superior to, fiat, to cryptocurrencies in every single aspect I can tell. And if you're doing the opposite, if you're comparing a badly managed cryptocurrency, it's a badly managed fiat currency, almost every money is better than that, including all of the entire crypto universe. But we do live in a country, in this country, in Europe and the United States, where fiat money is pretty well-managed. And we do deal with the issue of supply of money to deal with uh, uh, the price levels and the supply of money to deal with financial crisis pretty well. And that is drawing on the historical lessons. Under the gold standard, crisis was so bad because we could not do that. So the safety valve embedded in the fact we have a central bank that is well run is very, very valuable. And that safety valve is absent if you go into a cryptocurrency system. And that is why I think a crypto system would be much more unstable financially, economically, and socially than a well-managed fiat, fiat system. But of course, things could go really horribly wrong. Thanks for the question. Anyone want to take up this question of the, this issue of the over and gurney crisis in 1864? Very interesting, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure it was the most serious, but anyhow, there we are. No one wants to take it up. More questions and comments. Now, we've had a run from LSE. From LSE, are you? Ah, good. You qualify. <laughs> Uh, I'm Michael Wilton from Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, so, um, Christine Lagarde from the IMF recently said that governments should look into setting up their own cryptocurrencies. So my question is, and it's to all three of you, so Nicola, is it possible? John, is it wise? And Eva, what are the legal challenges to doing that? <laughs> Of course it's possible. The Marshall Islands passed a law saying that they're going to have a cryptocurrency as a national currency, and immediately the IMF came back saying, no, no, it's the worst idea, don't do it or, or, or else. So typical, you know, Western imperialism. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So to be honest, I don't think the Marshall Islands should be experimenting with this. I don't think they have the technical expertise or the, the, they don't have the capacity. I mean, it's, it's, I would put that in the category of joke projects. Uh, for a G7 uh, nation to be uh, experimenting with this, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, but the likes of uh, Singapore are experimenting, and also China, surprisingly. The People's Bank of China is experimenting in this space. So if, if this comes, I, I would expect it uh, out of East Asia. Uh, personally, uh, so I, I did speak to the Bank of England a couple of weeks ago. They've known the technology and then they understand it for the last uh, two, three years. It's not something new. Uh, but is it uh, politically palatable? Is it implementable? I don't think so. John? I think we have to make a technical distinction between the term digital currency and cryptocurrency. And the cent no central bank in the world is considering or should consider a cryptocurrency. What they are considering a digital currency, which is essentially a, a, a token as a form of asset, on a blockchain that they self pro, pro, provide the trust model for. So therefore, it's a, it's, it's a different animal altogether. All so therefore, I don't think we will see cryptocurrencies in the central bank. We, we'll, we might see digital currencies in the central bank. And by the way, besides the Marshall Islands, we also have the Petro in uh, Venezuela. This, this is another good example of a well-run cryptocurrency. Now, however, why would China consider this? Again, so we... So now China can destroy the crypto money supply if it go that way. But the key thing, if the central bank has a money supply on a blockchain, the central bank has power over all transactions in the economy. And remember, the China is now running the trustworthy citizens model and being able to control all the expenditures by Chinese citizens if it's a digital money would be a fantastic addition to the power of the Chinese state. It's not a power I would like to see given to the Bank of England or the ECB or the Fed. So if we are going to go down the road of a central bank digital currency, we have to step very carefully. So I've got three points I would, I would pay attention to. I, I think I would fix property law and ensure that property law applies to digital assets um, and underpin that with legislation. Another thing I, I would do is I would carefully look at how – so consensus mechanisms make it difficult to pinpoint time at which a transaction occurs because, because of the, the way sort of the ledger is updated, if it's indeed a distributed ledger. So you need to create a rule that it sort of determines priorities in transactions, so which transaction is before what transaction. And then I think a very, very big thing that you need to look at are, are technology providers and what their role is and, and whether they need to be regulated um, and what influence they have on the system and sort of there's a sort of new player that is introduced into the system. So there's free advice for the Treasury. <laughs> any, 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 anyone from the tax office? <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? So up here... Hi, I'm um, uh, Khalil Shaltout, ex-banker and uh, financial advisor. Um, I can see some uh, potential for the digital currencies. But when I look at the um, crypto, the, the crypto uh, currencies, I, and if we to consider it as a financial assets, one would wonder, what's the underlying assets? Well, what's the underlying asset of the pound sterling or the U.S. dollar? It's the uh, GDP of the uh, country, it's the assets of the country, it's the, the whole economic of the, the, the country itself. Uh, so the risk of confiscation, the risk that the, the state would confiscate that GDP in order to pay for, for the currency? Uh, absolutely, in a way, because it's issued by, as a tender by the, uh, by the Bank of England at the end of the day, or the Central Bank of any other banks. Here we rely on, I don't know, a question mark. I mean, we know that it is mining, but where is it? What's underlying assets for it? Who control it? There's so many questions. And uh, that's what I wanted to, I mean, I'll stop here, but there is so many. Yep. Well, thanks very much. Just we have some sort of Any supplementary answers or, or John, do you want to have I a I mean, go? what's the euro backed up by? I mean, the, the European Central Bank. Well, no, I, I, I can, yeah. 
Uh, it's a, it's a, I think the point you're making is it's a confidence trick, and I think all currencies Ooh. are confidence tricks, where you have to. Yeah. It's it's a belief system. It's not a, it's not an asset. It's a belief system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, by the way, the, 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 I think here this allows me to step in on Nicola's side, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> because the the money created by the ECB or the Bank of England only exists because the Bank the Bank of England promises this money will not be abused. Uh, we only have the promise of the Bank of England, just like we only have the promise of the underlying technology and blockchain that that the system will not be abused. And by the way. The central banks have not been as shy of abusing their powers. The dollar has fallen in value 20 percent in the past uh, 10 years. There's a transfer from one part of society to another. In 1948, the United States deliberately decided to cause a 15 percent inflation so that it could devalue, uh, deflate away the, it, its war bonds. So, and that has certainly happened multiple times in the past. And by the way, even if you go to gold, in, in 1933, the United States government confiscated private gold holdings and, and paid them out at a very small value. But that equally could happen, happen under cryptocurrency. So the state certainly it, it is not all that credible. But on the, if the alternative is the Chinese Communist Party, I would much rather prefer the Bank of England. Yeah. But it's, it's an excellent point because with cryptocurrency, it's a lot more difficult to actually confiscate. So we know how gold in its physical form can be confiscated, but cryptocurrency, which exists as a you know, digital stardust out there on a blockchain, unless you know the, the private key, which, which is like a very long password, you can't access it. So it's very difficult for, for a state or a central bank or anybody to, to, to confiscate. Not and, uh, may I ask, how do you then... The price fluctuations. Yes. So, so the volatility of Bitcoin has been very low. That's because so vo volatility is if it's up 10%, down 10%, that's volatility. But if it's down 10%, down 10%, down 10%, that's no volatility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it, it is. But, but so, so we don't have any good valuation theories or, or pricing theories to explain the value of of, and, and the value changes of, of these things. We, there, there's people proposing theories, but you know, nothing, nothing that works at the moment. It's a little bit like when, when the internet was first invented and we were counting the number of eyeballs in order to uh, value you know, the, a website. So, so at the moment, it's still astrology and voodoo. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll say, so Bitcoin are nothing, and why people pay for them, you need to ask them. Yeah. But um, money is nothing also, but we trust the central bank to control the money supply responsibly. I, I don't I trust that's... them. <laughs> he doesn't. I do. Yeah, I don't think it's a confidence trick. But anyhow, that's a comment. Yes, please. Down here in the front. Oh, come on. <laughs> They're arguing amongst themselves as to who's going to provide the microphone. <laughs> As we're discussing the future Could of money... Could you introduce yourself, please? As we're discussing the future of money, um, I want to envisage a world in which um, Nicola's dream comes true and we have replaced the existing fiat currencies with um, cryptocurrencies. And I just want to pose something which I think might be a question for Eva, actually. Recently, my niece died... And one of the difficulties we have in trying to contact people to let them know is that her entire address book is on her laptop, and her laptop is protected by a password which none of us know. Now, you can see where I'm going with this, that if your entire assets and your entire money are basically in the form of private keys that only that individual knows and something like that happens, where does that leave the entire system of settling debts after death, of inheritance, and indeed of you know, settling things like, sorry, taxes, they're not going to go away? Yes, yeah, so um, 
So the answer to that is, it is true. If your private key is gone, your coins are gone. Um, and that must mean that if we use digital currencies or a technology, the central bank uses technology for digital currencies, they have to design it in a way that the keys can be recreated for, for the reasons you give. But that's not, it's not a legal question. It's more a question of um, the key is gone. You don't have the asset. That's a feature of a current implementation. And that's not a, that's a, you know, that creates problems of whatever implement. If we go in this, you know, in this direction, that can't happen. Seems a very good point, Nicola. Uh, so, depends. I mean, what, what Eva said is, is absolutely true when it comes to bitcoins and, and things that you need the private key to unlock. Uh, many of the layer two, so if it's controlled by a smart contract, some smart contracts can have escape hatches. So, for example, to be AML KYC compliant, our company for our token, uh, we have the ability to freeze it if ordered by a court. So the family of the uh, deceased could contact, contact us and prove that this event has happened and we can unlock uh, her, his or her digital assets. Uh, some, and we have to do this to be compliant with law and regulation. If, if, if we don't do this, I personally you know, have, will probably end up in jail and I don't want to go to jail. So. <laughs> But with, with cryptocurrency, uh, you, you, so, so, so you, you can have, for example, multi-signature uh, arrangements where, where you know, the, there is a backup key hidden somewhere which can be used under certain circumstances. And there's probably things that can be uh, you know, written into, into the will as to, as to what the password is and, and how to access things. Uh, so I think it's st still an evolving area, yeah. Right. I'm looking upstairs. Oh, sorry, I should say the balcony. Um, no. Anyone downstairs? Right here. Oh, yep, there we are. Thank you. I'm uh, Peter Zimmerman from Oxford. Um, one of the benefits of um, a digital currency are, is the provision of privacy when you're transacting online. So I can use notes and coins privately, my counterparty and my bank doesn't have to know what I'm doing. And this isn't just for illicit purposes, but I might have genuine reasons to wish for privacy just as a human rights issue. But I can't use notes and coins online. So the only money I can use is bank intermediated or PayPal intermediated. So there's a third party who knows what I'm doing. And that potentially puts me at um, risk of um, privacy issues or uh, risk of spam or fraud. So um, my question is, is this, a, uh, is this privacy concern a legitimate use case for cryptocurrency or digital currency? Uh, yes and no. So some of the initial users of Bitcoin, I'm talking four or five years ago, were to pay divorce lawyers or, or uh, uh, for IVF treatment so that the insurance company doesn't find out because then they'll up your premiums and, and various these kind of things where privacy was the main driver. Uh, rather than the, the technology or, or some ideology. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, things have uh, moved on, and as an industry, we know how to, to track uh, uh, coin movements and link them to, you know, re-identification risk, as GDPR would put it. We know if, if we need to find, if, we, if law enforcement needs to find you, they can find you, and I suspect insurance companies and many other companies who, who you try to protect your privacy from, they can, they can find you as well. Uh, there are new things like uh, zero knowledge proofs is a good example, Zcash, where, where if you use stealth addresses, it's a payment from a black hole to a black hole of an unknown amount. Uh, there's the question of how much do you trust the underlying mathematics and, and uh, the implementation of it. Uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a range of uh, uh, you know, privacy solutions, but you shouldn't assume that, that, that by using Bitcoin or any other coin that privacy is built in. Uh, and, and I've discovered, uh, for example, going back to, to China and the, the People's Communist Party, um, Ch Ch China is probably 10 to 15 years ahead in terms of fintech compared to Europe and, and other places. And, and the main reason is that the products they have 
are enabled by the, by, by the lack of privacy laws and by the lack of consumer protection laws. Because someone was making the point, well, shouldn't we strive to be the global leader? And uh, to me, if it's at the expense of uh, human rights and privacy, then perhaps number two or number three is not so bad. Right, I'm going to invite final comments and questions. So we've got one down here. Any more? And there's one up there. So those are the last two questions that we're going to have. Down here, then. Uh, yeah, my name's John Moore. I'm at the LSE. Um, this, I gave a talk first thing this morning, and, and one of the uh, points I made was that, for those who were there, we might find ourselves moving northeast over the green line. I'm sure that makes complete sense to everyone else. Now, moving northeast over the green line meant that um, zero interest uh, currencies, whether they're crypto or regular, will all be ultimately driven out by interest earning currencies. And unless I've misunderstood the analysis, I think that will be the end of all this. This, this um, whole bubble will be burst at that point. So, um, so that's it, really. Yeah, yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> On that point, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it might be. Gold, gold is not interest bearing. Yeah, no, gold will be driven out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the only caveat to that is the demand for privacy is great for the reasons you folks have just been talking about, but I think there may be ways of re-establishing privacy by using classical interest-bearing accounts. In other words, so we could be using IBM stock to pay for apples, um, and there'd be no such thing as pounds and dollars, and we certainly wouldn't be using gold or cryptocurrency. And I don't think that's too fanciful. It may happen in the next 10 or 20 years. Interest. I'm, I'm not certain, so on the, on the rates point, I'm not certain how you balance... Uh, positive rates with infinite fractional reserve. I just don't think the two are possible together. So either we need to, you know, drastically change monetary policy, stop uh, inflating asset bubbles, and and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or we're going to continue to. Be, I, I think even if it's not zero or negative rates, it's it's. I think the Japanese call it a liquidity trap or something like this, where. Monetary policy has no impact on, on, on the economy. That, that's my feeling. There would be no money, that's the point. There would be no money. Well, so you're talking about di digital barter. You, you still need liquidity, yeah? I mean, because I don't want your IBM stock. I have apples, but I don't want your IBM stock. So you need, you need something in, in, in between. We need a new that's for sure, but we don't have to have money. We don't have zero, we don't have to have zero interest-bearing money, ally cryptocurrency. So the... John, yeah. After you made your speech this morning, I've been thinking about exactly your model of going across the green line. And I think there is an overlap between your model and this cryptocurrency debate, which is that the type of world you are describing is a tokenized world. So in a tokenized world, you exchange, you exchange an assets instead of moving numbers on account from one person to another. And one form of central bank digital currency is a tokenized asset. So therefore, you could certainly think about the technology being used in cryptocurrencies in the context of your model, and you might get to a very interesting point. So the, 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 and, and, and this is what I've been mulling over this afternoon, but I'm nothing beyond that. Answers later, yeah. Sorry, someone, yeah, there we are. Hi, um, my name's Shane, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, there's a question for Nicola, Nicola, sorry. Um, in your opinion, when, or should I say if, will the price of Bitcoin ever get high enough so that if I was to use one, I could pay for a trip to the moon and back? <laughs> well, that's an excellent point. I mean, Vir was it Virgin Galactic uh, sort of uh, sold about eight tickets to space in, and collected in Bitcoin? So, so it has been done? I mean, it was three, four years ago before, before the crash, and I don't know where they're now. Uh, when, when moon in terms of price, I don't know. Traditionally, every year there's a sort of a end of November, December rally, and then the January crash. Some people claim it's because uh, somebody in China is moving out of bank deposits into crypto and then reversing it, because apparently there is a tax on your savings in China, which, which, which is mind-boggling. So people want to have no balance in their savings account at year end to avoid paying the tax. I mean, 
It's, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, the, the people have predicted 100K, 300K within different time frames. I mean, if, if you look at the crash of the last couple of weeks, so Bitcoin's down 30, 40%. It's because of, uh, you know, infighting in the community and, and you know, people are, uh, uh, certain individuals are acting in bad faith and, and dumping all of their holdings for just to prove a point. And we've seen that every time that happens, after a certain period of time, it sort of things normalize again. So, I, yeah. On that basis, he's not, a, uh, he's not going to be able to get to New Zealand, let alone the, <laughs> the moon. Be the moon, maybe. Yeah. Now, look, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to have a final quick comment. So we'll start, I think, with Eva. Yes. So I, um, well, I think I would re, re, itiner, reiterate my point about the technology being something that, if it's useful, the law can accommodate it, and that property law should recognize digital assets. I think that would be yep. my takeaway. John, quick one. I have been trying to figure out what is the economic use case for Bitcoin beyond really, really niche ads uh, situations, and I really can't find one. So the, I sort of came up with the best analogies like collecting stamps. You collect stamps because you hope that some other collector will pay more for it in the future. But that is not a good foundation to put a whole economic system on. I do not see how you can convince the people in any country to start doing transactions in anything except the legal tender for, for a moment. And given the value proposition, and, 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 and when I run the numbers, the total value of base money in the world is $15 trillion. The total market value of cryptocurrencies is $150 billion. So therefore, you expect them to go up 100 times. Or to put it differently, a risk-neutral investor has, uh, gives uh, cryptos a 1% chance of success, which is, I think, way, way too high. But the, really, the challenge I have is that if cryptocurrencies become successful, we will get more price instability, we will get more financial st instability. That just follows from the basic mechanisms of how any, any monetary system works. So regardless of what you think about whether you, they're going to be successful or unsuccessful, they have a profound negative impact on society if successful, more price instability, more financial instability, not to mention the $15 trillion transfer from a handful of crypto speculators on the, from, from the public onto a handful of crypto speculators. This is profoundly unfair. So therefore, I see absolutely no reason for cryptocurrency to exist, and I hope they, hope they disappear as quickly as possible. <laughs> Very quickly. Uh, the debate continues. I hope to see you again at the next next time. Thank you. <laughs>